Administration and our distinguished guest speaker, Ms. Gwen I.L. Thomas. Ms. Thomas is a native of Prince George's County, Maryland. She attended Holy Cross High School, Elizabeth Seton High School, and would graduate from Reservoir High School. Ms. Thomas would describe herself as a natural native. And as a young woman, Ms. Thomas desired to express her artistic ability as a tattoo artist. Through hard work and dedication, Ms. Thomas would be admitted to University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she would earn recognition as a Meyerhoff Scholar and would receive a scholarship covering 85% of her tuition, resulting in her graduating with zero dollars in student loans. It was during this time she connected with the first black neuroscientist she'd ever met. This black neuroscientist would become her boss today at Duke University. It was his work in mental health that would inspire Ms. Thomas to pursue her chosen profession. I have no doubt experience and exploration of mental health, neuroscience, and biotechnology presented with the utmost creative expression. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our expert neuropsychopharmacologist, Ms. Gwen I.L. Thomas. Thank you so much, Dr. Richardson, and I'm so excited to be here today to share my research with all of the scholars and staff, so thank you for having me today. And I will start my presentation. All right, so I have a very quick outline. Wait, did this advance? No, it didn't. Let me click harder. Okay, I have a very quick outline for what I'm going to go through today. So I'm just going to start with who am I, then go on to why it shows science, my current field, and the projects that I'm working on, and I'm going to finish up with some advice. So the first thing, who am I? So I have a couple of pictures that I've taken from my time just in graduate school. So in the top left, that's me holding a brain. In this middle right here, this is me um, earlier this semester actually making up some drug solutions. So that's the stuff that I'm working on in lab. Here I am presenting my research at a conference. This is the picture that you saw on the flyer, just me in my white coat. Uh, this was when I first started grad school here, so I was doing surgery. I actually started grad school when I was 21, and I was obsessed with 21 Savage, so I used to call myself 21 Surgeon. And so, like, I used to show up with, like, my bottoms in, and I have all types of, like, piercings and stuff, so you can absolutely still be a professional and express yourself um, physically, artistically, as long as you know, like, when to tone it down. So right now I'm giving a professional talk, so I might not have all of those things out, but in my day-to-day, -day, I can have that. Here I am with one of my friends and coworkers. We were doing an exhibit at a museum in North Carolina, so we actually ran a brain exhibit for the day. And this last picture here is just me um, doing a surgery. So I was wearing a face protector and the mask, some personal protective equipment. So this is kind of what my day-to-day -day looks like and just an insight of what it is for me to be a neuroscientist. Now I'm gonna go on to who I actually am and like a little bit more about my background. So I'm a first-generation immigrant, which means I'm the first person who was born in America from my family. So my father's Haitian and my mother's Dominican, and both of them came to America in like the 90s then. I grew up in New York, then eventually for elementary school and early middle school, I moved to Maryland. So I, I live in Laurel, or before I lived in North Carolina, I lived in Laurel, Maryland and PG. So shout out the gorgeous Prince George's, Pretty Girl County, whatever you know it as. And then I went to high school there. I went to college at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And then now I'm doing my PhD at Duke University, which is in Durham, North Carolina. So I'm kind of like progressively going further and further south. But actually, after I graduate, I want to move back to the DMV. Then a little bit about what I used to want to do. I didn't always want to be a scientist. So I started out when I was really young, I wanted to be a firefighter. I don't know why, I just thought it was so cool. And then once I got to middle school, I was obsessed with the idea of being a lawyer. I don't know if you guys remember that young Dolph so song where he was like, she likes to argue, so I sent that girl to law school. I was like, I like to argue, I'd be a perfect lawyer. And then, I met some lawyers and it didn't really seem like that interesting for me. And 
then once I got to high school, that's when I was like, I feel like an artist. I love drawing. I love painting. And I actually got my first tattoo when I was 16. And I fell in love with the process. I was like, I want to be a tattoo artist. I didn't even want to go to college. I was like, I want to go and find an apprenticeship and just be an artist full time. But then something actually just drastically changed my life. So when I was in high school, my sophomore year into junior year, my best friend from childhood had this huge diagnosis of a mental illness. And what actually happened was he started acting like really different. Um, he was really antisocial. He didn't want to be around me anymore. He didn't want to be around our other friends, our family. He had a bad temper out of nowhere. He had a lot of what we call risk-seeking behavior. So he actually started using like very hard drugs, which actually ended him up in prison and he's still there today. And so he was just acting completely out of character. And it was like such a drastic change, like literally zero to 100. So it took about a year, but eventually he got the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And I had never known anybody with schizophrenia before. I didn't understand what it was. And everybody reacted differently. So the picture here, I'm showing a world map. And the reason why I'm showing this is um, my family is from this island here, Hispaniola. So that's where Haiti and the Dominican Republic are. And my best friend was from Argentina. And I actually looked up the distance. It's like about 4,000 miles away. And the reason why I'm showing this is even though these countries are super far apart from each other and it's not even on the same continent, our families actually reacted in the same exact way. Oops, I think I'm going backwards now. Let me fix this. So our families actually had the same exact reaction to the schizophrenia diagnosis. And what that ended up looking like was, let me see if I could fix this slide. Sorry, guys. Okay. So what this ended up looking like was the first thing that happened was both of our families were like, oh, like, we don't believe that you have a mental illness. Like, you just should pray over this. Like, the reason why you're depressed, the reason why you're having all of these, like, anger issues is because you don't have a good relationship with God. So that was the first thing that happened. And then after that, then the solution or their suggestions were oh well you probably just don't exercise enough like you should probably just go outside and sit in the sun and that didn't help either then after that it was just oh well exercise didn't work and praying didn't work so let's try natural medications i have this really good tea let's try these essential oils let's try these different herbs and see if that will help but that also didn't help either and so after all of that was said and done, then it was just, we're not going to talk about this. Like, this is too taboo. It's too embarrassing. And this is not what happens to people who look like us. Like, Black people, Hispanic people, Latino people, we're not going to therapists. We don't have these issues. This is, like, what my family and their family would say is, like, this is not something that happens to our community. So that ended up having some pretty bad reactions for my actual friend. So he just felt ashamed of himself all the time. I don't know if any of you ever watched Game of Thrones, but this is like the scene where Cersei is walking and like the nuns are behind her with the shame bell. And so he just felt so embarrassed and he didn't even want to be around people. He felt disgusting and just like unworthy of our attention and he didn't want to talk to anyone. So he actually became even more isolated, which worsened his mental illness. And then how I reacted, of course, this is my best friend. This is somebody who I've known my entire life. I wanted to help, but I didn't really understand what was going on and everything happened so fast. And I was also like 15 years old at the time. So what I started to do was trying to research schizophrenia in my free time and I started taking some classes in high school. So 
my high school, they had an AP psychology course. And so I took that elective, I think either my junior or senior year of high school. And I started to learn a little bit about it, but we didn't really go in detail about schizophrenia as a whole. So then when I went to college, I actually tried to make my own major. We didn't have a neuroscience major at UMBC, but I studied biochemistry and molecular biology, and I got a minor in psychology. And so through that, I was able to take classes like abnormal psychology or neuropsychopharmacology, which is a class that I fell in love with, which is why I'm doing what I do today, or like the psychology of aggression. So I took all of these different classes, and then now... I'm doing my PhD at Duke in neurobiology, which allows me to study neuropsychopharmacology. And so now I'll talk to you a little bit about my field and what it is that we do. Before that, I just wanna go over some mental health statistics and talk about why I'm so passionate about this field and actually how common this is. So one in four people in their lifetime will be affected by mental illness. That doesn't mean that you'll have it forever, but that means something like one in four people has been depressed before. One in four people might have anxiety or something like that happen. Also, in addition to how common this is, people of color, so black people, native um, or indigenous people, Latino people are less likely to have access to like quality health care. And so this ends up manifesting as huge health disparities that you might have a Black person who's mentally ill and they might not have the options to get therapy and go to rehab. They actually might be criminalized for it. So if you are someone like my friend who was using drugs, instead of it being an option of we're going to try to re rehabilitate you, now is you're going to be punished and all of this has to do with how racism and um, health is in our current society today. And lastly, suicide is actually the third leading cause of death like in America. So just pointing out some, st st some statistics before I go on to the actual profession. And I just want to break down the word neuropsychopharmacology. So neuro refers to brain. Psycho is referring to studying the mind, and pharmacology just has to do with medication or drug treatment. Now, what do neuropsychopharmacologists do? We study how drugs affect the body or change human behavior. So that could be things like Studying if you take this medication, does it make you sleepy? Does it make you happy? So studying things like that. Then the next thing that we do is we actually conduct experiments in the lab with these drugs and interact with patients who actually take these medications. And so these patients for me are people who currently have mental illnesses. So this could be something like depression or anxiety or a neurological condition. So if someone has chronic pain or autism spectrum disorders, that's another example of a neurological condition. So actually talking to the people who take these pills. And then the other thing that is required for neuropsychopharmacologists is when we're thinking about levels of education, most people either have a master's degree or a PhD, that's a doctorate in philosophy and chemistry, psychology, or biomedical sciences, or a medical doctorate or an MD. And lastly, neuropsychopharmacologists earn between $80,000 and $200,000 a year. So it's a pretty well-paying field. So even though that's what my career is now, I don't currently make that much money. I'm still in school, so I'm a graduate student. But graduate school has some perks. So my tuition is completely paid in full. So I'm going to school for free. Not only do I go to school for free, but I also get a yearly stipend of $36,000 a year, which is pretty affordable for where I live in North Carolina. And I also get health insurance from that. And I still have zero student loan debt. So I went through all of college and graduate school. I'm about a year out from graduating and I have zero money that I owe to anyone. So it's worked out pretty nicely. Now I'm going to talk to you about some of my current projects. 
So I'm starting first with electrophysiology. This is probably going to take the most time, and this is the thing that's going to be a little bit more complicated to explain. So that's why I'm spending more time on it. So the first thing that I want to bring up is our brain is actually an electrical circuit. A circuit just means that there are different parts of electrical components that exist together in a circle. So I'm using this example on the left here of a Christmas tree that has these lights. So all of these lights, if you've ever seen them, they're connected by a string, and that's how you get all of these different colors or all of these different lights, but they're all connected on the same exact string. So it's the same thing that like in the brain, you have different parts of the brain, but at the end of the day, it's a circular system and all of these are connected together. So now I'm going to talk about what happens if one of the things in this electrical circuit goes wrong. And I'm just waiting for the slides advance. Let's see. OK, so sometimes when you're looking at this string of lights, you might have one light bulb that goes bad. And if that's the case, it's pretty easy to figure out that it's just this one light that needs to be replaced. But now if you're looking at this picture on the right hand side where you have a whole bunch of lights that are now dim, it gets harder to figure out which light bulb you need to replace. And that's what happens in a circuit that like if one thing fails, like number one fails, then that means two through 10 will also fail. And that makes it hard to figure out if you need to replace light bulb number one or two, or maybe you need to replace all 10 of them. And that's the same thing that happens in mental illness. When we're looking at um, the brain, we need to try to understand what part of the brain is not actually responding the same way that it should in its electrical circuit. So if you're looking at this picture on the left hand side, this is what the brain would look like if all of the components of the electricity were working properly. But what if you have a system like this where you have an entire um, set of brain cells or neurons that aren't properly communicating anymore? And I'm going to give an example of what this actually looks like in real life. So here, this is a picture on the left of a brain, and it's looking at how these different parts of the brain interact with each other. So in the purple here, this is a part of the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is something that is associated with thinking or making decisions. Back here, this is your hippocampus. So hippocampus has to do with memory. And then over here in this green yellow color, this is a part of your brain called a striatum, which has to do with reward or pleasure. And so when these parts of the brain don't communicate properly, this actually ends up um, affecting people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. And so how this works is instead of the prefrontal cortex being able to make like logical decisions or using your memory to say that, oh, I understand that this felt good or I like doing this, that communication is lost. And so people end up having these cravings or they have like these binges that overwhelm them. And it's like, I have to do this because now the part of their brain that likes the reward is going to constantly be stimulating them and say, I need external reward. I need to take drugs because drugs make me feel good. And that's what it looks like when your brain isn't communicating in a circuit properly. And so what I study is how to get that so that we can actually fix that circuit and make it look back how it used to be in a normal situation. And so that's this picture here of how do we get this part of the brain to show up how it used to be before without affecting all of the other parts of the brain that are working properly in the circuit. So the first thing that I'm looking at here is an, a neuron. So this is actually what the neurons look like. And you can see that there are these um, white things that are passing through. So this is actually the electricity that's going through your cell. 
So every single time your brain cells or your neurons communicate, there's actually electricity that's passing through your body. And we can actually measure that electricity. So that's called an action potential. And this on the left side here on this bar, this is measuring the electricity and voltage. And so you have the same amount of electricity that happens every single time this action potential happens. And so we can make a graph like this that actually shows that this is when the cell is firing and now we know that part of the brain is communicating. And so what we can do with this information is actually um, translate that to understand how different parts of the brain are working using that electricity. So when talking about mental illness, you might have heard people say things like a chemical imbalance before. So there are things in your brain called neurotransmitters. So that is things like dopamine or serotonin or acetylcholine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's related to pleasure. Um, serotonin, that's like a happiness or just like feeling good. And acetylcholine, that's a neurotransmitter that's related to attention. So when people talk about chemical imbalances in the brain, that could be an example of like depression, for example. So people who have depression have less serotonin in their brain. And not only can you measure that there's less serotonin, but all of these neurotransmitters actually carry electrical charges. So we can measure that electricity and say that, hey, we know that something is not working as it used to before. And I'm talking now about the evolution of neuroscience technology. So this, these are three different pictures that I'm going to briefly go through. The first one over here, this is a picture of a lobotomy. So I don't know if any of you have gotten a COVID test where they put the Q-tip in your nose. So how a lobotomy actually works, it's basically like a COVID test but like a hundred times more intense. So they would either put a drill or a needle through your nasal cavity to go through and reach your brain and try to remove some brain tissue. And so they stopped doing this in the 1950s because they were like, this is wildly inaccurate. And they didn't really understand what parts of the brain they were trying to change. And so that's why they don't do this anymore. So this was a super painful procedure and it hurt a lot and it wasn't accurate. The next thing that I'm looking at here in the middle, this is electroshock therapy. And so what people used to do if they thought you were mentally ill or had depression or schizophrenia, they would basically put a metal helmet on top of your head and just shock you and hope that that would kind of like reroute your brain or reset your brain. And so they stopped doing this in the 1980s for the same reason of just this was super inaccurate and they didn't understand how to help people. The last thing I'm showing here, this is actually a picture of me holding a brain. So before, um, I would say probably the 1990s, people couldn't really image the brain or they couldn't see the brain. So you had to wait until somebody died in order to see what was going on with their brain. So this is me holding um Somebody donated their brain to the medical facility, and so I got to hold it and study it and look to see what was going on. But that's not really a good system either because you want to figure out how to help people while they're alive instead of just waiting until they, they're dead to study what's wrong. So luckily, a lot of technology has changed, and we have way better systems now that we can study things while people are alive. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, electroencephalograms or EEGs. So how this works, this is basically like a shower cap that we put on someone's head. And this has a whole bunch of little stickers or metal electrodes. And this is um, this has wires that are co connected to a computer. So here I am, and I'm actually putting this EEG on someone. So we can actually read out that electrical activity as long as this is sitting on top of your scalp. 
And so this is a really good way to measure the brain activity and you don't have to get surgery. You don't have to have a drill go up your nose and we can see things while people are still alive. So that's really important. The next thing I'm going to show you is a functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. Maybe you've had this before. So how this works is you're going to go inside of this giant tube and it is basically a super magnet. And how this works is it actually measures your blood flow. And the reason why it measures your blood flow is the same concept of like when someone is exercising, their heart is pumping and your blood is going to be flowing all over your body. It's the same concept that like if your brain is working and you want to see how certain parts of your brain are involved in different tasks. So if I ask you to describe how to ride a bike, the part of your brain that might be really active might be your memory or your motor cortex or the part of your brain that has to do with movement. And so on this picture here, anytime you see things in red, that means an increase in activity. Or if you see things in blue, that means a decrease in activity. So red means that there's more blood flowing to that part of the brain, while blue means that there's less blood going to that part of the brain, which means it's probably not involved. But this is also important because let's say somebody had a stroke or has something going on in their brain. So you can see this in real time without having to have that person get surgery or a part of their brain removed. So technology has changed a lot and we don't have to do all of these really awful procedures anymore. So I'm going to show you an example of how healthy brains actually have different electrical activity than brains that might have mental illness. So in the top here, this is an example of an EEG. So that's like the shower cap with the stickers that I was talking about. And all the little black dots, that's everywhere that an electrode or the little sticker is. And the same thing that I was talking about with the colors, that red means increased activity or blue means decrease in activity. So this is somebody who is healthy and who does not have schizophrenia. And then this is comparing to somebody with the stickers in the same exact place. And you can see that they have significant decreases in activity in certain parts of their brain, which can explain why they have some trouble with some symptoms like difficulty thinking, or maybe they can't regulate their emotions properly. So you can actually see in the brain that it's not behaving the same way as somebody without mental illness. And so I talked about looking at the brain from the outside, but now I'm going to talk about what I do in my day-to-day -day research when I'm looking on the inside of the brain. So I'm showing this picture here of like, what does the, what happens if you stick a fork into an outlet, which is basically what I do with my research. And so if you've ever stuck a metal fork in an outlet, which I hope you haven't, but if you have, you know that like, you would shock yourself because there's electricity that's running through the wall and the metal is going to be a conductor and take up that electricity. So we've actually figured out a way to do this safely and tap into the electricity that's in the brain. So what we do is we use something called electrodes. And what you're looking at here is actually a diagram of where our metal forks or our wires in the brain go. So this is an actual video and picture of where these wires would be and how we can record the electrical activity that's in the brain. So we can figure out different brain regions that might be involved in mental illness. So earlier when I was talking about the hippocampus and memory or the striatum and reward, or let's say the amygdala, if you want to look at how people regulate emotions. So we can put these little wires or these little metal forks in different parts of the brain and record their electrical activity. So then the next thing I'm gonna show you is what we can actually record, what type of information we can get from this experiment. So we talked earlier about action potentials. And so on the left here, this is an animation of just showing the electricity again and the action potential. So this is called a single unit, which means you're only recording from one neuron at a time. 
And this is important just because we want to know how different parts of the brain behave. And so in different parts of the brain, you have different neurons. So we can record that. And this is a picture of neurons that I was actually able to record. So this is from a surgery that I did, and I'm showing you different neurons. So every single time you see a different color, that means that this is a different brain cell or a different neuron. So this blue, green, yellow. So here are three different brain cells. Or here with the red, green, yellow, blue, this is showing four different brain cells. So this is in the striatum or the part of the brain that's related to reward. And then on this last panel here, that is a part of the prefrontal cortex or the part of the brain that has to do with thinking. So that's one thing that we're able to record with those surgeries. And then the next thing that we can look at is called local field potentials. So instead of looking at just one neuron, I can actually look at what happens with a hundreds of thousands of neurons. So like you're taking the average activity of all of this to look at what does the region look like instead of what does just one cell look like. The reason why that's important is because while it's important to look at small details, you also want to be able to look at the big picture too. So here is a picture of a field of flowers and you can see that in all of these different rows, you see all of these different colors, and that means that you probably have different flowers. So it's important to see that, yes, you have these different rows and colors. And for the most part, like here, if we're looking, this entire row is orange, which is kind of how the brain is set up too, that neurons or the brain cells that behave together are usually close together. And so if you have orange flowers, they're usually always going to be by orange flowers. But what's important is from when you're looking at the big picture, it's hard to see the details. So if I wanted to look at this row here, I can tell that this is a yellow row of flowers, but I actually don't know what flower it is. It could be a daffodil, it could be a sunflower, it could be a daisy. And that's important because not all drugs work the same. Maybe the drug only works for sunflowers or maybe the drug only works for daisies. So it's important to be able to record both small details and the big picture so that I can go in and say that, oh, I know that this part of the brain is, let's say, a sunflower and now I know I should use medication that will work for that part. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the slide to advance again. Okay. So yeah, this is what I was just saying about being able to see specifically what that part of the brain is. So, the reason why I bring all of this up is now going into how drugs actually work. So when you're being treated for something, for any um, disease or illness, not just mental illness, these medications go all over your body, which means that sometimes people have really bad side effects. So if you're looking at the picture on the right, this is showing all of these different things. So this could be like seizures, panic attacks, insomnia, heart attack. And you have all of these different side effects because the, the drug is not just going to affect the sunflowers, but it might affect all of the flowers in the field that it might have different um, outcomes and it's not going to help everybody. But what I'm trying to study is to figure out how can we only treat the sunflowers or how can we figure out using the brain's electricity so let's say this purple part of the brain here is the part of the brain that isn't um, behaving properly how can we use electricity to specifically target that part of the brain or the sunflower and so if we do that maybe we would have less side effects so instead of having all of these things that happened before, maybe now the only side effects are like headache or you might not be able to eat as much, but it's more desirable than having all of these other things happen. So that's what I'm studying with the electrophysiology. So the next thing that I'll move on to is the pharmacology. So this is studying how the 
um, drugs actually affect us. What we do is we actually use animals to study how drugs work. And the reason behind this is you wouldn't want to take a drug that's never been tested. So we actually have a whole bunch of different animals that we, we can use in science. So this could be like monkeys, mice, pigs, flies, you name it. I actually use mice. And the reason why is because mice, they're super small. They are pretty cheap and they're actually 85 to 90 percent genetically identical to us so when we think about our genes so things that give us like our hair color or our eye color mice they share 85 to 90 percent of those same genes so what i do is i study how those drugs work in the mice to see how it would work in humans but actually 95 percent of all drugs that are tested in animals fail in humans and this gets even worse when we look at drugs with mental illness. And the reason why is because mice can't self-report. And what I mean by that is I could ask somebody in the audience here today, hey, like, how are you feeling? And you could tell me, oh, I feel tired or I feel sad. And then we could talk about why. But with the mouse, I can't ask it those questions. It can't tell me. And so I'm just looking at how it behaves. I'm looking to see, is the mouse limping today? And maybe that means it's in pain. But I don't really understand what's going on and it makes it really hard to make those drugs. And so now going on to pharmacology and behavior to bring all of this full circle with my research is I'm actually going to start off with um, telling you a little bit more about schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a mental illness that affects about 1% of the global population, which means about 70 million people in the world have schizophrenia. Um, a lot of people with schizophrenia have delusions, so that's believing things that aren't true or hallucinations, which is seeing or hearing things that aren't there, like there is pizza coming out of the wall, or I think that the floor is made of lava, and like you actually truly believe those things and see those things. Um, a lot of people with schizophrenia have a difficulty thinking or planning ahead or communicating their emotions, or they might be paranoid. Here on the right, we're looking at this graph that's showing the age of onset. So schizophrenia is a mental illness that happens pretty young. So for my friend, he got diagnosed when he was 17 years old. And that's pretty normal that people are diagnosed in their late teens or early 20s and 30s. And men are diagnosed with schizophrenia more than women. And so how schizophrenia is treated, there is um, antipsychotic drugs, or these are the medications that are used to treat psychosis. So those are the things like hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. And when these antipsychotic drugs are working, it's targeting that neurotransmitter dopamine. So that's the pleasure neurotransmitter. But it turns out that dopamine is related to more things than just pleasure. So it's also related to learning, pleasure and reward, and movement. But a lot of these antipsychotics, again, they have really bad side effects. And so when you're thinking about when it affects learning, that means some of the side effects of this drug might be that people have a really hard time learning or they can't think straight or they might not be able to remember things as well as they used to before they were taking the drug. Something else that happens is one of the side effects is people actually might take this drug and become depressed or maybe you used to really enjoy certain things like let's say your favorite food was tacos. Now you take this drug and you don't even want to eat your favorite food anymore. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't give you pleasure. And that's a really bad side effect too. The last side effect I'm going to talk about is with movement. There's something called tardive dyskinesia, or people lose the ability to control their movement. And you can usually see this in the face, the tongue, lips, or extremities like your hands or feet, which means that like your hands or feet or your face might actually get frozen, and you can't actually figure out how to like tell your body to move those body parts anymore. And so all of these things happen with these drugs, which means that there's really low patient compliance, or in other words, people aren't going to take drugs that make them feel worse than the symptoms that they had to start. And so if somebody's like, I only hallucinate, let's say, once a month, but this drug makes me feel bad every single day, I'm not going to take it. So I'm studying how can we make better drugs that are actually going to treat those symptoms without having all of those nasty side effects. 
just waiting for the slide to fast forward. Okay, so now when I'm testing these medications, um, a rule of thumb is a good antipsychotic reverses psychosis. And so one of the drugs that I use, fencyclidine or PCP, this is a drug that induces psychosis. For humans, it makes them super strong and usually aggressive. So if you can think of like the Hulk. But again, since I work with animals, what PCP does is it actually makes them really hyper hyperactive and it makes them like run around in circles and they also get pretty aggressive and they'll like try to bite me and stuff. And so what I'll do is I'll give them mice PCP and then I'll test other drugs to see if those drugs, the antipsychotics, make the mice behave normally again. And if that works, then that's a good drug to be on the market. And so instead of just looking at the behavior, I'm also going to have those metal forks or the wires in the brain too, so I can see what the electricity looks like inside of the brain while the mice is on PCP or while it's on the antipsychotic, so I can get a better understanding of how the brain looks during a mental illness and with different drugs. And that is what my research is. So now I'm just going to finish up with some advice of things that I wish that I knew when I was in high school. So when I was in high school, I was super broke. Like I had no money and I would always work during the school year or I would work during the summer. So when I was in high school, I used to run track, but then I got injured my junior year of high school. So after that, I worked as a track clerk. So this is the PG sports and learning complex. So I spent a lot of time there. I worked there until I was a junior in college. And then during the summer, I used to work at Ruby Tuesday. And so I wasn't really making that much money. And I wish I knew that like you could get summer internships or there were all these scholarships and paid opportunities. And all you have to do a lot of the time is ask. So like there's Carisha from, um, or Young Miami from City Girls and she's holding her hand out because like she's always talking about like, yeah, like get the paper. And that's, that's really what you should do. Like now that I'm at Duke, we have so many opportunities where we work with high schoolers all the time. And so like there are so many opportunities where you can get up to like $5,000 as a high schooler over the summer. So all you have to do is ask around and um, yeah, like people will help you out, especially if you're interested in science. The next thing I would say is like start branding yourself, especially now with social media. We see all of these influencers. You have little kids who are making millions of dollars a year just reviewing toys and stuff. So like just don't be scared to put yourself out there. Start your YouTube, make your Twitter, Instagram. If you are a creative person and you have merchandise, start selling it, make a website, post your art, whatever it is that you want to do, put yourself out there. So I'm going to show you examples of some of my stuff. Um, so this is a screenshot of my Twitter up here. So like, it's kind of a joke that I have with my friends, but I call myself like neuro sweetie, like sweetie, the rapper. Cause I'm like, I like brains and my baby hairs are always super laid and swoosh. So this is like my actual Twitter and this is my professional Twitter, but it's just showing that like, you can still like embrace parts of your personality and put yourself out there. I made myself a personal website here. So this is my website in the bottom. And then this is some of my art that I do. So I'm combining my passion of science and also still painting. So I'll do like commissions and get paid for it. And I would have never known that I could get paid for it if I didn't start telling people that, hey, I'm an artist. I really enjoy doing this. And the last thing I'm going to show you is just something from my Instagram. So I'll like, um, I do a lot of like science communication videos and I'll like use either like a song or try to speed up a video when I'm showing things of what I'm actually doing in lab. So I'm still waiting for this slide to advance. Sorry, this computer does not like me today, but this is, this is like the last slide. And then after that we could do questions because I know that we had a lot of technical difficulties. So this is done after this. Um, let's see. Oh, it looks like the screen is frozen on my end. Actually. Oh, okay. So this is one of the videos that I put up and I like, 
will take my phone and just record myself doing a surgery or record myself like doing something in lab and basically explaining what I'm doing and why. And so this is showing that like you don't have to only communicate science in one way or only show up and be professional how people think that you should in certain spaces. And the last thing that I'm going to say is like find like-minded people to support you. So this is here I am at a scholarship dinner and it's very obvious to tell who I am because I'm the only black person. And there's nothing wrong with this. Like these are some of my coworkers and I like them a lot, but sometimes it gets hard being like the only black person in the space or the only Latina person in this space. And it's really important to find people who look like you, who act like you. So here I am at a different scholarship dinner and just being goofy with my coworkers. This is actually my boss. So he's from Montgomery County and he's just squatting, doing whatever. This is his wife. These are some of my other coworkers. And so like we are super goofy and we're not as stiff as we were in the first picture. And then... I'm just showing more pictures of like my friends and people who have supported me along the way. So like I still have my friends from college. I have my coworkers who I can act myself with all the time. So this is like my college graduation picture on the left. And like this is me and my boss again. We were actually celebrating something. So like we're in the club right here. And these are some of my like black women mentors in neuroscience. So like there are tons and tons of people who will let you be your full self all the time. And I'm just going to end with my last piece of advice of just like network and put yourself out there. Let people know what you're interested in. So I'm a member of a historically black sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And so this is my dean, Ashley um, Ajay. And so Ashley's actually the person who introduced me to Director Richardson. And if not for actually knowing that I love science and I love doing all of these opportunities, I would have never known about today. And then here's another picture here. I'm at a conference. So there I am. And here are my coworkers and stuff. So this is Eric Kendall. He is a Nobel laureate, which means he won the Nobel Prize for um, uh, medicine and physiology in 2000. He was doing work studying the memory and the brain. And so I've read so many of his books and like, I was just networking and talking to him and being like, Hey, I'm really interested in this. And I'm talking to him about jobs. And so just like knowing to talk to people and not be scared to tell people what you're interested in. Cause you never know what opportunities will come out of that. Like I never in a million years thought that like I would talk to someone who has a Nobel prize. So that is my presentation for today. Thank you so much for letting me talk and I am ready for questions. All right. All right. Uh, can you give me back control, Ms. Thomas? Yes. I'm working from two devices here. Okay, so we're going to go into the chat. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. That was fantastic. Um, and just respond to it. We'll ask a few questions from scholars. So I'm going to focus on the ones that have the most likes. Uh, okay, just, perfect. Uh, we have a few minutes remaining. So Simeon asked, COVID affects brain function. What specifically happens when COVID enters the brain? Yeah, so um, we're still studying that now. What we're seeing for some of these long-term effects of how COVID affects the brain is it also affects those action potentials or like the ability of the brain to communicate with each other. And so some people who had really bad cases of COVID, their brain actually kind of looks like stroke victims where you have long-lasting damage and those brain cells aren't able to communicate communicate the same way so like if you remember with the fMRI image where it was showing the blue and the red so if you look at a, a person who had covid and a very severe case then it ends up showing that like you're having decreased activity in certain parts of the brain which is not something that's a good thing because 
those are harder to treat when you have permanent damage. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you think going to a therapist is good even though you may not have a mental health issue? Yes, I completely support going to therapy. I have a therapist. I'm not ashamed to say I have a therapist. And I think it's really important because not only does it help you like understand more about yourself, but like it also helps you just like regulate like your day to day emotions. And it's been really important for me as someone who is black and is West Indian. So like sort of try to unlearn some of like that generational trauma of like there was a long time where like I felt like oh I shouldn't be crying about this but then like my therapist would be like it is okay to cry if like something happened or you don't always have to be strong or put on a brave face and so I support everyone going to therapy but I also know that therapy is not always affordable or accessible to people so like if you have the option to go and it is something that is in your like reach, I support you going, even if you don't have mental illness. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Could the fMRI substitute for the other tests or do they tell you different things about the brain? Yeah, they tell you different things about the brain. So each one of these techniques has like pros and cons. So with the EEG, that's the technique that kind of looks like the shower cap with the stickers. Um, you can only record parts of the brain, it's called cortical or parts of the brain that are close to your skull. And so when you're looking at, like if I turn my head to the side, like I could only record from here, but I couldn't record deep in my brain, like here where I'm pointing now. And so the fMRI, it might be able to look deeper in your brain, but then you're not going to be able to get that same electrical activity. You're only looking at how blood is flowing. And so each one of these gives you different um, readouts. And so, for example, if somebody has seizures, it's really easy to see the seizures because it changes the electricity really fast. Whereas if you took an fMRI and you had a seizure, it might might not be able to tell you that that person is currently seizing because you're just seeing how the blood is changing. Thank you. And last but not least, a lot of people like this question, so they really want to know, how did you get zero dollars uh, debt free for college? Like, what did you do? Yeah, um, scholarships. So like, there are so many different opportunities for people to get money. So right now, even Megan, just put out a scholarship on her Instagram. Um, she's giving two $10,000 scholarships. Um, when I went to college, I had applied for the Meyerhoff scholarship. So I'm just speaking from a science perspective, but like whatever it is that you're interested in, people will support artists, people will support writers and um, creatives, people will support music producers, people will support, like, there's so many different avenues that you can get money. You just have to look for it and really spend the time to ask for help. So, like, I got tons of feedback on my application. I went to writing centers. I had so many different people read my statement and edit it. But the good thing is, once you have a really good application, then all you have to do is slightly change it each time. And so I don't have to spend as much time applying for certain positions anymore because I know that, let's say, last year I might have spent a week working on an application. But now if I'm applying for something else, I only have to spend like maybe one hour doing some minor changes. And so asking for help, going to professionals. So if you have like counselors at your school or if you have a writing center or even reaching out to people who are already in college or like me, for example, like I will read your college essays. I'll help you apply to scholarships. Like I'll put you in contact. So that goes back with the networking thing. Like now that like you've met me today, like we're tapped in, we're locked in, we're like this. So like you can email me, you can get my contact from Dr. Richardson. I'm so happy to talk to high schoolers always I will help you do whatever it is that you want to do and even if I don't know how to do it I'll find somebody who can absolutely fantastic thank you Miss Thomas uh, it is 1246 so we're not going to keep our scholars 
beyond now. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your presentation. It was phenomenal. Thank you, scholars, for being alert audience members um, and asking great, great questions. And again, you can follow up with Ms. Thomas uh, via her Instagram, uh, Twitter, or simply email. OK, so please make sure you fill out that evaluation form. If you have a question that you didn't get to ask, just include it in that form and I'll make sure Ms. Thomas gets it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Can you see the chat, everybody? Yes. Oh, I'm like, I'm like blushing. Like I, I put on blush, but I'm blushing even more than my blush. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Sarah, gonna. What we usually do is let the students um, like exit, and we can we can just debrief. So if you okay, stay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Full house. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah.